Well, we're on now to our second uh, portrait of the greatness and the glory of God by taking a look now at God, the God of redemptive covenantal love. You know, Don Carson wrote a book a number of years ago. He's a New Testament scholar, taught at Trinity Divinity School for many, many years, a school that I have taught at also some time back. He wrote a little book that I'd recommend to you if, if you don't have it, uh, entitled The Difficult Doctrine of, and you might think the rest of the title would be The Dif Difficult Doctrine of Hell, or The Dif Difficult Doctrine of Divine Judgment, or something like that, right? But here's the title, The Difficult Doctrine of the Love of God. I mean, most people think the love of God, that's the easy stuff, right? That, that's the good stuff. That's, that's just, there's nothing difficult about that. But the fact of the matter is, it is a difficult doctrine if you actually look carefully at the scriptures in terms of what the love of God means. And uh, you, you realize that the love of God is not the simple thing that many Christian people, many churches proclaim it to be. Here's the simple love of God as many churches would affirm, that God loves everyone equally with in equal measure, and, and, and distributes his favor to all people just the same. There's no distinction in how God loves different people. And I would argue that that understanding of God, uh, of the love of God, is taught in the Bible. Uh, but I only know of two passages that teach it. Now, there may be more. I keep telling people when I talk about this, if you know of another passage, you let me know, because I'd love to add a third one to the list. But I know of two passages. I have it on the, the handout for you under universal love. John 3.16, I think, is clearly the universal love of God, the universal, impartial, equally distributed favor of God to all people in God sending his Son. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Now, the reason I think that the world there is not, as some of my Reformed friends say, the world of the elect, all the elect throughout the world. They take it that way. I'm sorry, but that doesn't, that doesn't fit the context. Uh, look down a couple verses at verse 19. John 3, 19. Uh, this is the judgment that light has come into the world and men loved the darkness rather than the light, for their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light, does not come to the light. Well, so light has come into the world, obviously, that, that's a reference to the world that includes unbelievers, right, who reject the light. So this cannot be, you know, just the world of believers. It cannot be. And so I think it's special pleading to say in verse 16, uh, when he uses the same wor word in verse 19 of clearly believers and unbelievers both, that world is just the world of the elect. No, it isn't. It's all people. So God so loved the world, all people in the world, that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. The other passage that I think teaches the universal love of God, not as directly as uh, John 3.16, but as Matthew 5 verses 43 and following, where Jesus commands his followers to, to, to love your neighbor. And you, you have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Now look at this. So that you may be sons of your father who is in heaven, for he causes the sun to rise on the evil and the good, sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous, so you love your enemies as God loves those regardless of whether they are believers or not and sends rain. So it's not just Christians' crops, far farmers uh, who, who get rain. It's also unbelievers who get rain and, and likewise sends the sun to shine on the evil and the good. So there, here's another example, I think, of the love of God equally distributed to all people. Okay, so I think this is taught in the Bible. However... Having said that, it is not the only way the love of God is described in the Bible, nor is it the main way that the love of God is described in the Bible. 
Instead, the vast majority of the references of God's love as it relates to us, to people, is his particular, his targeted, his specific love for his own, by which he will stop at nothing <laughs> to, to bring to them everything that he has designed for them to have in their salvation and for all of eternity as his own. He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all. How will he not with him freely give us all things? Freely give who? The world? No, us. All things, right? So his particular love for his own uh, is, is uh, indeed, so I call it his co covenant redemptive love. The love that leads him to pledge that he will bring you in, choose you, um, regenerate you, uh, give, give you forgiveness by your faith, uh, put his spirit within you. I mean, all that God does with his own that he does not do with unbelievers is the particular, special, targeted love of God that I'm calling here his redemptive covenantal love. And there are many, many, many passages in the Bible for this. I just have three here to look at before we dive into Isaiah 43, which is probably one of the most stunning examples of the particular uh, redemptive covenantal love of God. But a few other passages. So, for example, Romans 9.13. You know the passage, don't you? Jacob have I loved, Esau have I hated. Now, there are <clears throat> teachers out there uh, who would say of that passage, well, the reason God loved Jacob and he hated Esau was because of the way Jacob lived his life versus the way Esau lived his life. So Esau was really a jerk. He was a sinner. He, he was faithless. And so God had no choice but to hate him and bring judgment upon him. But Jacob was, was a believer. He was trusting in God. But you know what? That understanding of Romans 9.13 is absolutely false. Do you know how I know that? Because of the context. Before the two were born, before either had done anything good or bad, that the choice of God, that the purpose of God according to his choice might stand, it was said to her, the older will serve the younger, as it is written, Jacob have I loved, Esau have I hated, before the two were born before either had done anything good or bad. That the purpose of God, according to his choice, he chose Jacob. He did not choose Esau. And when, when Paul says then, Jacob have I loved, Esau have I hated, he's quoting from Malachi 1, where Malachi 1 begins with this question to God from Israel, from, the pe from his people, who say to him, how have you loved us? which is not a question that's asking, oh God, rehearse for us all the ways that you have shown your love to us. It is not that. It's a finger pointing at God saying, you have not loved us. That's what is behind that question. It's an accusation. How have you loved us? And he says, I've loved you, but I've hated your brother Esau. And furthermore, I will bring Esau down to, to, to the ground and destroy him in judgment in the end. And even though he tries to raise himself up, I will destroy him. That's Malachi 1. That's the context from which Paul then takes that statement, Jacob have I loved, Esau have I hated. So you just realize that this verse is indicating that God chooses, right, his purpose according to his choice, that God chooses those to whom he will give this uh, abundant, uh, mm, glorious, saving, redemptive, covenantal love, and those from w with whom he w withholds that love. It is his choice. It's his from election on, right? God chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and blameless before him. So it is, it is from the choice of God from eternity past before he even created the world of those whom he would love savingly. And, and stop at nothing to give them everything that he has designed for them. Whereas others, he would not. And sometimes the others that he would not are just in the category of they don't get what believers do get. But in other cases, it's rather they get judgment where his people get salvation and blessing. As, as in this case with Jacob, have I loved Esau, have I hated? 
So there's one example. Ephesians 1, 5 is another example where verse 4, I just mentioned it to you a moment ago, verse 4 of Ephesians 1, uh, that the Father chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to himself, to the praise of the glory of his name. So here, here is another you know, use of the love of God in the Bible, which is a love not for all people in the world, but for those whom he has adopted into his family, whom he predestined to be adopted sons and daughters of his, as, as he's determined who they would be. So, you know, the fact that adoption is used with the love of God, I think, is, a help, is helpful to us. Because any adopted, adoptive parents um, would, would say that though they love other children that were in the orphanage or other children who were awaiting adoption, they love them also. But there is a particular love that they bestow upon their own adopted child or children that they don't show to the others, right? I mean, goodness, you feed them every morning and every lunch and every dinner and sometimes snacks in between. I mean, you feed them their whole of their lives. You, you save money for them for college. You, you, you pay the medical bills for them. I mean, you bestow upon them so much favor because they're your children, right? I mean, we all do this in families where, where, where they're adopted or not, natural children as well. But if they're adopted children, it's not that you don't care about the others, you do. But you have a special care for your own. You get it? So indeed, you can love your enemies, as Christ said to do, and yet have a special love for your own. In fact, ought you not do that as parents? Ought you not? as a parent, have a special love for your own, so you are caring for them. I mean, goodness, if you tried to care for everybody, you can't do it. This is way too many needs to try, try to deal with. Impossible. You're called to care for your own. So here, here is the father caring for his own because he's chosen them to be his adopted children, a particular love for them. The next passage also helps, Ephesians 5.25, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the world? No, not here. That's John 3.16. Here it is, God so loved the church and gave himself for her that he might sanctify her, that she would be in the end holy and blameless. It's interesting. Just make a mental note of this, that in Ephesians 1.4, Paul says that the Father chooses us before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless. Ephesians 5.27, Christ dies for the church that she would be in the end holy and blameless. So what the Father elected us to be, Christ brings about for us as he sanctifies us and makes us in the end holy and blameless. Okay, that's a little aside. Now, what's the point though? Husbands love your wives as Christ loved the church. He had a special love for the church where he sanctifies her. She is his bride. He will do everything that is necessary to purify his church, to make her holy in the end, to bring about her sanctification and, and, and her, her, in the end, her glorification. This is done by Christ for us. Of course, the whole Trinity is involved in this, but nonetheless, there is a particular place that Christ has in not only our forgiveness of sins, but our victory over the power of sin, and our sanctification throughout all of our lives and our ultimate glorification that takes place through Christ. So that, that is what he gives to his bride, the Christ, now, uh, bride, the, the church. Now, isn't it helpful again that this love of a husband for his wife or a groom for his, bri his uh, bride uh, also depicts the love of God? Because any husband out there, you know, you need to love your wife in a distinctive way. You need to love her in ways you would never dream of loving another woman or any other person, right? There's a special targeted devotion, affection, thoughtfulness, planning, strategizing, um, time and effort expended in love for your wife that you do not spend with any other person. And isn't that right to do that? 
Well, does that mean, oh, well, you don't care about those other people? Oh, no, that's not true. But you do care about this person in a particular way because she's your bride. Do you see it? So, indeed, I think this helps because we, we can understand how you can have a general love for all people, right, a universal love for all people, and yet have a particular love just for some. We do that with our children, Ephesians 1.5. We do that with our wives, Ephesians 5, 20, 5 to 27. So indeed, this is not that unusual, really, when you think of it, of a particular love just for some. And the fact of the matter is that the Bible unpacks God's love for us almost exclusively. I, I say almost because there's John 3.16, there's, there's Matthew 5, two exceptions. Almost exclusively with his targeted, particular, devoted, attentive love for his own that will stop at nothing until he has brought about everything good for their lives. Amazing love that the Father has for us. Charles Spurgeon, he captures it in this brief little quote from one of his sermons. The Lord then has a people whom he regards with a special love, which is not shed abroad in the hearts of others. These people he set apart for himself from eternity. There it is. So the Father has a special love for these people. That's not true of everyone else, but it is for believers. So rather than feeling like this isn't fair to everybody else, think, isn't it amazing that I'm a recipient of that devoted love? That's how we should respond. Incredible to be the recipient of that devoted love. I mean, a, a wife who is loved in a, in a very tender and thorough way by her husband is not going to sit there on the couch one day thinking, oh, why isn't he loving all these other women the same way? Are you kidding? She's not going to think that. She's going to think, how incredible, what a, what a privilege it is that he's my husband and that he has loved me and loves me so fully. That's what she's going to think, right? So that's how we should think, my friends, how incredible it is that God loves us with that special love. All right, well, let's, let's turn now to Isaiah 43, verses 1 to 7, which is one of the most astonishing passages in the Bible, I think, that helps us see this covenantal, redemptive covenantal love of God that is there. So God's redemptive covenantal love extolled in Isaiah 43, verses 1 to 7. Isaiah 43, 1 to 7. Uh, let's read the passage first, and then we'll go, and we're just going to work through it uh, verse by verse and see how it unfolds. I'll be reading from the New American Standard Bible, Isaiah 43, 1 to 7. But now thus says the Lord, your creator, O Jacob, and he who formed you, O Israel, do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they will not overflow you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be scorched, nor will a flame burn you. For I am the Lord, your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. I have given Egypt as your ransom, Cush and Seba in your place, since you are precious in my sight, since you are honored and I love you, I will give other men in your place and other peoples in exchange for your life. Do not fear, for I am with you. I will bring your offspring from the east and gather you from the west. I will say to the north, give them up, and to the south, do not hold them back. Bring my sons from afar, my daughters from the ends of the earth. Everyone who is called by my name, whom I have created for my glory, whom I have formed, even whom I have made. All right, well, let's begin here thinking about, first of all, capital letter A on your outline under Roman numeral two, God's redemptive covenantal formation of his people established. God's redemptive covenantal formation of his people established. Notice in verse one, how God establishes the fact that they are his people. Why? Because he made them his people. So what does he say? But now says the Lord, your creator, O Jacob, he who formed you, O Israel, 
So notice when he says that, forming them, creating them, he, he's, he's using words from Genesis chapter 1, create, bara, right? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female, he created them. So in, in verse 27, so he uses the word bara, create, so he's the creator, uh, he's the one who formed them. That's the, the Hebrew word yatsar that he uses in, in uh, Genesis 2, 7. God formed man from the dust of the ground. But when he says, thus says the Lord your creator, O Jacob, he's not referring back to Genesis 1 that when God created the world, he created them because they come from Adam. That's not the point he's making. He's making rather the point that he created them to be his people, right? So he chose them and, and in that sense, created them as the people of God. He formed them as the people of God. So he's using the language of the creation of the universe to apply now to them as his people. He created and formed them. And by the, word that, by the way, that word creator in Hebrew uh, recognizes a work that only God can do. You, you never find anything else other than God who can bara, who can create in that way. So God is the one who made them his people. And then notice he goes on to say, do not fear for I have redeemed you. So he not only owns them as it were by virtue of creating them to be his people, he owns them secondly by virtue of redeeming his people. And of course we know from the verses that are about to come that he has in mind the Exodus. When God took them out of slavery in the land of Egypt, he redeemed them from that slavery, from their bondage there, and brought them into the land that he had for them. So he's the redeemer of them. So they are twice owned by God, as we are twice owned by God, by virtue of creation and by virtue of redemption, okay? But then he says, the end of verse 1, I have called you by name, you are mine. So who names kids when they're born? Parents, right? So every now and then, Jody and I will receive our church news bulletin. They call it the messenger. And we'll take a look at uh, some of the children who were born that month, uh, that, that particular month, and look at the names on there and go, really? Are you sure you want to name that precious little girl that? You know, it's just like, hmm, don't know if that's a good idea or not. But you know what? We're not the parents, so who, who cares what we think, right? about that. Parents have jurisdiction over them, right? Isn't that the point? Because they have jurisdiction over them, they have the right to name them. Well, God says, I have called you by name. You are mine. You get it? To name it is to indicate your ownership of it, your, your rightful jurisdiction over it. And in a very literal way, he named Israel who was Jacob, right? So back to earlier in verse 1, but now says the Lord, your creator, O Jacob, and he who formed you, O Israel. Same person, Jacob, who was named Jacob at his birth, Jacob and Esau, but then renamed Israel by God, right? So indeed, he, he names us as his own, and therefore he has rights. So rights over us by creation, by redemption, and by naming us. It's pretty clear he's the one who has rights over all of us. Secondly, take a look at capital letter B, God's redemptive covenantal commitment to his people expressed. So because he has jurisdiction over us, because he has created the people of Israel, called the people of Israel, uh, redeemed the people of Israel, named the people of Israel, here is his promise to them. Verse 2, when you pass through the waters, I will be with you through the rivers they will not overflow you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be scorched, nor will the flame burn you. Why? Because you are mine. Do you see it? I will be with you. I, I will care for you because you are my people. So notice the images there, the waters, the river, the fire. They are all symbols here of harm and destruction, symbols of forces that can overpower their victims and render them helpless and ultimately destroyed. But God is with them, right? I will be with you. This is stated again in verse 5, do not fear for I am with you. So notice that this is God being with who? All the people in the world? 
No, no. I am with you, my people. I created you. Don't miss the connection between verses 1 and 2, right? I created you. I formed you. I redeemed you. I called you by name. You are mine. So when you pass through the fire, when you pass through the water, I will be with you. Oh, my goodness. This is precious. This is just gloriously uplifting and strengthening to know that the infinite God of the universe, who spoke and it was done, <laughs> that's the words of Psalm 33, verse 10, I think, right, right around there, who spoke and it was done. That God, with that power, that wisdom, is with you in everything you go through in life. What? I mean, we just need to remember this, don't we? We need to remember during difficult times God is with it because that, that's what this verse is describing. The waters, the rivers, the, the fire. I mean, this is difficult times, difficult experiences. I am with you, God says. So remember that. Don't forget that the resource I am to you that I commit to you because you are mine, my people. Um, notice, just let me read again verses 1 and 2, and I'm going to purposely stress the personal nature of this, the you and yours that are stated here over and over again. Um, so listen, ver verses 1 and 2, but now thus says the Lord, your creator, O Jacob, he who formed you, O Israel, do not fear for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you and through the rivers they will not overflow you when you walk through the fire you will not be scorched nor will the flame burn you isn't that amazing i mean he really wants us to get this point do you know i am with you do you know what that means to, for for you to be strengthened in faith when you go through trials and difficulties to know that i am with you when you face things obstacles you don't know how to overcome I am with you. So indeed, he calls upon his people to trust him because of that. Capital letter C, God's redemptive covenantal love for his people expanded. Okay, I just want to give you a warning here. Here is where we make a turn to where it gets difficult. So far, this, this is all good news, isn't it? Okay, well, let's read verses 3 and 4 again. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. I have given Egypt as your ransom, Cush and Seba in your place. Since you are precious in my sight, since you are honored and I love you, I will give other men in your place and other peoples in exchange for your life. All right, so who is this God? Well, notice it's the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel. So he's making it very clear. You know, Lord, if you should see that it's in all caps uh, in verse 3. When you see Lord in all caps, capital L-O-R-D, um, it, it signifies the name Yahweh, which used to be pronounced years ago, Jehovah. Uh, and we have some songs, you know, that came using Jehovah, so that has stuck around for that reason, but most scholars believe that the best pronunciation of those four consonants in Hebrew uh, from Exodus 3, 14 is, uh, is Jehovah, I'm sorry, is Yahweh instead of Jehovah. And that it's the covenant name of God. So when in Exodus 3, when God had told Moses he's gonna go back and deliver the people out of, out of Egypt, um, Moses asks him, when I go back and tell them that you've called me to, to deliver them out of Egypt, who shall I say sent me? And God responds, tell them, I am sent you. So that I am is a way to translate what is here transliterated of the name of God, the I amness of God, the eternal God, the one who is and always is, who was and is and is to come, to think of the language in the book of Revelation. So indeed, he is the God of Israel. And in the context of Genesis 3 and 4, 
This is the God who has covenanted, has come down and seen his people in need, promised to deliver them, promised to bring them out of the land of Egypt, promised to bring them into the land of promise and milk and honey and, and all the rest and to deliver them from their enemies there as well. So this is this God of covenant promise, of, uh, of work on their behalf to make them his people and that he would be their God and that they would live in this land that he had given to them. So, so who is this God? He is the Lord, your God, the Holy One of Israel. So he is God over all, but he is in a particular way our God. Have you ever thought of this? how many, many people in the world worship as their God, serve as their God, one who is no God at all. Hinduism, full of gods. I just, you, just, you just think of, oh my goodness, how sad that is. Whereas we Christians, true for Israel at this time, um, know as God, the one who is, the, 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 our God, we know as our God, the one who is the true and living God. It's just incredible to, to, to see that and to believe it, that we actually know because he's come to us, he's revealed himself to us, he has made himself known to us, and he has called us into his family, and you know, all these things we're talking about, he created us, re redeemed us, and and called us by name, and all this, that we are his people, the people of the true and living God. So indeed, we, we recognize that he is, yes, God over all, but he is our God in a very personal and particular way. Okay, now, beginning halfway through verse 3, we learn something about how God worked on their behalf out of his love that is quite startling. So, I mean, I've heard scripture reading sometimes in churches. I've heard this several times or in chapel at Southern where you read verse 1, verse 2, and halfway through verse 3, and you stop. Here's where the scripture reading ends. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. End of scripture reading. Why? Because look what comes next. I have given Egypt as your ransom, Cush and Seba, which are areas to the south of Egypt, so it's actually a portion of the, of the nation of Egypt, Cush and Seba in your place. So what Isaiah is referring to here then is the Exodus, where God actually favored his own people, showed them compassion, showed them mercy, brought them out of the land of Egypt, delivered them from their bondage, while he also brought destruction to the Egyptians. Right? This is what he's referring to, is the, the, the remarkable difference in the plan and purpose of God in how he treated Israel and how he treated the Egyptians. Israel favored, loved, cared for, forgiven, brought out of the land of Egypt. Egypt, they're, they're responsible for their sin. Their children die in, in the... Uh, uh, the angel of death coming over, and, uh, and the, whole, the whole army of Israel dies in the Red Sea. So you realize the difference between these two. And it's possible, you know, a crucial question, I think, to ask about this, is it possible that something about Israel commended her to God so that his salvation of Israel, but not of Egypt, has something to do with Israel's faith in God Israel's hope in God that Egypt did not have, right? How do you account for the disparity of how God ha treats Israel and how God treats Egypt? How do you account for the disparity? Well, if you think, well, maybe it's Israel was, you know, the people of God and faithful to him and trusting in him and following him. My friends, I'm sorry, it's not true. Oh, they were the people of God. They were supposed to trust him and follow him. They were supposed to obey him. But you know the truth? They had turned away from God and were worshiping the idols of Egypt. How do we know that? Well, you don't know it in the book of Exodus, or it's just hinted at, just, I mean, you, you would miss it if you didn't see it elsewhere. But turn with me for a second to Ezekiel, the book of Ezekiel, chapter 20.
Ezekiel 20. At this point, Ezekiel has been complaining to the Lord that God is not bringing judgment upon his own people because of their flagrant sin during Ezekiel's day, which, of course, is many, many years later from the Exodus. But God says to, to, um, to Ezekiel, Ezekiel, you need to understand they've always been this way. This disobedient, hard-hearted people, they've always been this way. And so he takes them on a little, takes Ezekiel on a history lesson to see what they were like before. Pick up with me at verse 4. Um, will you judge them, that is the people of Israel today, will you judge them, son of man, Ezekiel? Make them know the abomination of their fathers and say to them, verse 5, thus says the Lord God, on the day when I chose Israel and swore to the descendants of the house of Jacob, and made myself known to them in the land of Egypt, when I swore to them, saying, I am the Lord your God, on that day I swore to them to bring them out from the land of Egypt into a land that I had selected for them, flowing with milk and honey, which is the glory of all the lands. I said to them, watch this now, cast away each of you the detestable things of his eyes and do not defile yourselves with the idols of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. But they rebelled against me and were not willing to listen to me. They did not cast away the detestable things of their eyes, nor did they forsake the idols of Egypt. Stop. Don't keep reading. Listen. Now, without reading any further... How bad is this, do you think, in God's estimate? You know, the fact that they were commanded by God to turn away from the idols of Egypt, but they didn't do so. They kept worshiping those idols. Is this kind of a light thing or is it a heavy thing? What do you think? Ah, okay, now we can keep reading. So here is God's estimate of what they have done. Halfway through verse 8. Then I resolved to pour out my wrath on them to accomplish my anger, uh, anger against them in the midst of the land of Egypt. Isn't that incredible? This is how bad their sin was. In fact, I would argue that the sin of the Israelites here worshiping the gods of the Egyptians was worse than the Egyptians worshiping the idols of Egypt. Why? Because Israel knew the true God. They're in the situation like Jeremiah describes in Jeremiah 2. They've built cisterns for them that can hold no water and have forsaken the fountain of living waters, right? So they, they have forsaken God in order to worship these other idols. And so I would argue their sin is worse than the sin of the Egyptians, right? So why did God not bring upon them in Egypt the anger that he speaks of here? Why did he not do it? Next verse, verse 9. But I acted for the sake of my name, that it should not be profaned in the sight of the nations among whom they lived, in whose sight I made myself known to them by bringing them out of the land of Egypt. Okay, now stop. What do you think he means when he says, I acted for the sake of my name? How is God's reputation, his name as the true God, uh, how is that at stake in how God treats the people of Israel? Well, he promised them something, didn't he? What did he promise them? He pro yeah, I wish this was a class. I mean, I'm used to teaching a class, right? You know, so uh, he promised them, look back at verse 6. On that day, this is when he called them to be his people. On that day, I swore to them to bring them out from the land of Egypt into a land that I had selected for them, flowing with milk and honey, which is the glory of all the lands. So when God makes a promise, guess what? He keeps it. God keeps his word. This is why, goodness, there's going to be a restoration of the nation of Israel in the day to come, because God keeps his word with his people. Promises in the Old Testament, scads of them have never been fulfilled. Do you think for one moment God is not going to keep his word and fulfill them with Israel? Oh my goodness. I just, you know, there's so many people out there, theologians, Bible teachers, and so on, who don't believe this. I just really, you don't take God as his word, you don't believe he keeps his promise? Well, here's what it says at stake in this for, for God's own name 
is I have promised them, and so that's why I'm going to do it. Notice it has nothing to do with they deserve to be brought out of the land of Egypt. It has nothing to do with that. No, what they deserve is punishment. So notice, just think with me about what God did with, with Egypt to distinguish his attitude toward Israel versus his attitude toward the Egyptians. Ten plagues, right? And notice in every one of those plagues, frogs, gnats, bloody water, all of them, uh, the first nine anyway, all of them, Israel was spared the difficulty that came to the Egyptians, right? And so just by that, you're, you're getting the point. I mean, nine times in a row, it happens that Egypt is harmed in some very specific way by the God of Israel, and Israel is spared that difficulty. So it's very clear God is, is establishing, I favor my own people, right? And then comes the last plague, where God told the people of Israel to take a lamb, cut its throat, put the blood over the doorposts of your house, so that when the angel of death comes, he will pass over. So the Passover that is celebrated is exactly about this. He will pass over your homes, and he will go to the homes of the Egyptians and kill the firstborn in every home and in every stall. So it was cattle and animals as well as it was children uh, in, in those homes. And, and he would spare the Israelites that very thing that he brought upon the Egyptians. And now you realize from Ezekiel 20, Israel deserved the very same thing that Egypt got. You see it. It was not because of their piety. It was not because of their, their moral uprightness. It had nothing to do with that. They were guilty, deserving condemnation. By the way, so are we. So, God showed mercy to us. Well, who are we before God apart from Christ? Guilty sinners who deserve only his condemnation forever and ever. What do we have to commend ourselves? Nothing. It is God's mercy shown to us who do not deserve it. It's the very same thing that, that we, we see in his salvation of us also that you see with Israel. Though they deserved his judgment, in his, in his amazing um, benevolence, kindness, mercy, he brings for, uh, forgiveness through that shed blood of that animal to them, forgives their sin rather than bringing judgment upon them for their sin. That sin which he, that, that um, judgment that he brought to Egypt. And you know, and after the wailing of the Egyptians over the firstborn that, that was killed, do you think God thought to himself, oh my, you know, I wish I had thought to tell the Egyptians to take a lamb and put the blood, blood over the doorposts of their houses too. No. This was not God's plan. He did not forget to tell the Egyptians about this. He rather showed his favor to his own by deliberately planning the salvation of his people and the judgment of the Egyptians. You see the same thing when... They leave, they leave Egypt, and they come up against the Red Sea, and they know the Egyptian army is behind them, pursuing them. You know, Pharaoh kind of like comes to his senses and realizes, oh my goodness, I've let all these people go. They're slaves. They were helping him with the, you know, the work that he wanted done and so on. So he sends his army to go bring them back. Well, the army approaches, and as it does so, God puts a cloud down between, fog down between the Egyptian army and the Israelites, so they can't see where to go. So through the night, that cloud is there, and during the night, God tells Moses, raise your staff. He raises his staff, and the waters of the Red Sea part. So in mor when the morning comes, the light sh shines, they see then an open pathway for how many people? Do you know how many people there were? I mean, one million is a very conservative number. I mean, no doubt, way too small. Probably more like three to four million people we're talking about who crossed the Red Sea and, and go, you know, go safely to the other side on dry ground. And so 
God, God told Israel to go. So they went across the Red Sea. And when they all got across the Red Sea, then what did God do? He lifted the cloud. So now the Egyptians can see that there's this pathway that is there that they can go on, their armies can travel on to go and get the Israelites. So they commence and they start going down the pathway of the Red Sea that had been opened by God. And what does God do next? He tells Moses, raise your staff, Moses. This is God. This is God doing this. Raise your staff, Moses. And as he does so, the waters come back and engulf the entire Egyptian army. Every single soldier and animal was killed as the Red Sea came and, and engulfed them. And they saw corpses coming up on the ground after that was over. So you realize, my goodness, the, the disparity in how God treated Israel and how God treated Egypt could not have been more glaring, could not have been more pronounced, and yet Israel was equally guilty before God, deserving everything the Egyptians got. But they were shown his mercy. Why? Okay, look with me back at Isaiah 43 again. Here's the answer from Isaiah 43, verse 4. So remember again, he, you know, I have given Egypt as your ransom, Cush and Seba in your place. That's all a reference to what happened in God's deliverance of his people out of Egypt. Verse 4, since you are precious in my sight, since you are honored and I love you. There it is. What explains God's, the disparity between God, how God treated the Israelites and how he treated the Egyptians? Huh. You are favored in my sight. I have loved you. Therefore, I give other men in your place and other people in exchange for your life. So indeed, we realize that the Exodus, God's greatest saving act in the Old Testament, anticipates then the cross of Christ, his greatest saving act ever, right? It's not just in the New Testament, it's ever, the greatest saving act ever, where God sends his son, behold the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world, like take a lamb, cut its throat, put the blood over the doorpost. So here's God sending his lamb to take upon himself our sin, die a death on the cross. We deserve to die so that the whole world is saved? No, no. I mean, here's the truth, my friends. He could. He could have done that, save everyone. He's God. But rather to save those whom he has chosen, the elect, uh, his chosen people, and, and, and to um, pass over the others, right, and, and reserve for them the judgment that is to come. I think one passage of Scripture helps us with this action of God to favor his own and to bring judgment on others is in Romans 9, Verses 22 and 23. It's the closest thing I know of in the Bible that helps explain what's happening here. Where you see the greatest display of God's love can only be seen against the backdrop of his just judgment against sin. Romans 9, 22 and 23. What if God, although willing to demonstrate his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much patience vessels of wrath prepared for destruction? He did so in order to make. So here's the purpose clause. This tells us why God brought wrath upon others, vessels of wrath prepared for destruction. He did so in order to make known the riches of his glory upon vessels of mercy which he prepared beforehand for glory. You see it? I mean, it, the analogy has been used many times. I think it's an apt analogy of the black velvet backdrop to a diamond. My parents used to own a jewelry store, and I have many you know, memories of the jeweler in that jewelry store turning a bright light on and taking this velvet pad out of the cabinet 
and then putting diamonds on it, right? That shows off the glitter, the beauty, the splendor of those diamonds, but only because of the black velvet backdrop, right, to it. So here is the glory of God manifest in ways it could never be seen in the salvation of sinners who deserve to be condemned. That's us, all of us, no exception to that. We all deserve nothing but everlasting condemnation. But he's chosen us, and he's given his son to die for us, and he has worked in a way to bring to us salvation by which we may be forgiven of our sins, released from that condemnation, released from the guilt of our sin, brought into everlasting life with him. And what helps show that off, as it were, is the backdrop of his just judgment against others that he will bring to ruin in the end. Everlasting punishment of those who are in hell forever. And I just, you know, I just want to say to you on this that if you struggle with this, I understand that. We all do. But here, here's what I offer to you as help in the struggle. Uh, if your moral sensibilities begin to go the direction of this isn't right for God to do this, this isn't fair for God to do this, then you just have to ask yourself one question. Who has moral superiority here? Me or God? Do you really think you're the one whose moral sense is tuned in better than God's is? Really? Who has greater wisdom in terms of designing what is best? You or God? So ultimately, who are you, O oh man, to answer back to God? This is what Paul says, right, in, in Romans 9. Who are you to answer back to God? Don't you realize we can't fathom the ways of God. We simply fall before him in humility and acknowledge his ways are right. Will not the judge of all the earth do what is right? Indeed, he will. So we re realize that, that indeed God has designed this and... In his mercy, we who are in Christ are the recipients of his redemptive covenantal love that will bring to us everything that he has promised that will go on forever and ever. Indeed, um, well, yeah, take a look with me at Ephesians 2 for just a moment. Ephesians 2. It's so interesting where Paul talks about God's mercy in saving us when we were dead in our trespasses and sins, when we were children of wrath even as the rest. And then he goes on in verse 4, Ephesians 2 verse 4, but God being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us. Here it is. This is saving love, right? This is to his own people. Even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved, and re raised us up with him, and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that, verse 7. Now, here comes the explanation of why we've been saved from the Apostle Paul. And you'll notice something about this. It says nothing about our lives right now. What does it talk about? Ah, listen. So that, why have we been saved? so that in the ages to come he might show the surpassing riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. It's like this life is a blip. <laughs> this life is a vapor. You know, this, this life is hardly anything compared to the eternity that God has prepared for us. You know, the bounty of the display of God's kindness toward us in heaven will never end? I mean, imagine the Christmas tree that you take a present from it and two more appear. You know, so you just keep opening presents and it never, I mean, it's going to be like this in heaven. God will display, look at the language, you know, the lavish display of his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus in the ages to come. It'll never, there will never come a day when God says, you know what, I've run out of goodies, N nothing else to give you. No, no, he's designed this forever. So indeed, that display of God's mercy and grace is only seen for what it is 
against the backdrop of his judgment. And that's what Romans 9, 22 and 23 tells us. Okay, moving on. Capital letter D, God's redemptive covenantal pledge to his people extended. So now notice in verses 5 and 6 how determined God is to bring about his saving work, his redeeming work on their behalf. Verse 5, do not fear, for I am with you. I will bring your offspring from the east and gather you from the west and say to the north, give them up, and to the south, do not hold them back. Bring my sons from afar, my daughters from the ends of the earth. Everyone who is called by my name, oh, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not going to read verse 7 yet. I, I, I jumped ahead. I'm going to end at verse 6. Bring my daughters from the ends of the earth. So notice God's covenant commitment to his people is the basis for the opening admonition that we saw in verse 2, do not fear for I am with you. I will be with you always. And so his being with us means he's determined to bring in everyone who is his. So I will bring your offspring from the east, gather you from the west, uh, I will say to the north, give them up to the south. So his reference to the four points of the compass, right, is a way of indicating no one will be left out who is one of my children. My sons and daughters from afar, I will bring them in. And notice it's God who will do it. There will, will not be anybody on the day of judgment who says, I really belong to you, but you're not bringing me into heaven. Oh, no. <laughs> if he doesn't bring you into heaven, you're not one of his. If he brings you into heaven, it's because he sought you out and brought you there. He sought me and he bought me. You know, as the hymn says, victory in Jesus. So God's commitment is extended to the four corners of the earth. Notice the certainty of this salvation in verses 5 and 6. I will bring your offspring. I will say to the north. Do you see that? So the definiteness, the certainty, the deliberateness of God bringing this to pass is highlighted. And the uh, the complexity of his relationship with his people is shown here because on the one hand just before Isaiah 43 (laughs) guess what God's message to his people was at the end of chapter 42 I am bringing judgment upon you go back and look with me these are the verses that lead up to where we began look at the last two verses of Isaiah 42 verses 24 and 25 who gave Jacob up for spoil and Israel to plunderers? Was it not the Lord against whom we have sinned, and whose ways they were not willing to walk, and whose law they did not obey? He, so he poured out on him the heat of his anger and the fierceness of battle, and it set him aflame all around, yet he did not recognize it, and it burned him, but he paid no attention. So here is God's disposition toward his people. On the one hand, this current generation is toast. This current generation will receive my full judgment. Northern kingdom, the Assyrians took them in 722. Southern kingdom, coming after Isaiah, 586. Babylon took them captive, destroyed Jerusalem. So you realize the present generation of those Israelites are going to be judged by God, but your descendants your children. So here's one of the most amazing things when you read the prophets in the Old Testament. Don't miss this. You'll see it over and over again. Here it is, that God's final word to his people, to his people, is not his word of judgment, which he gives to them often. Oh my, there's a lot of words of judgment to the people of Israel for their sin against God. But his final word to his people is not his word of judgment. It is rather his word of reclamation, salvation, restoration, coming back and being my people and entering into the fullness of what I have for you. So indeed, Israel has promised this because God has given them his word. You will be my people. I will be your God. It's a glorious thing to see. Okay, then finally, verse 7. Now we'll read it. Everyone who is called by my name and whom I have created for my glory, whom I have formed, even whom I have made. So notice he goes back to the same terms that he began verse 1. He formed them. He made them. He created them, right? 
But notice here the difference. In, in verse 1, he says of those whom he formed and whom he made, I have called you by name, right? Look back at verse 1. I have called you by name. Verse 7, everyone who is called by my name. It's different, isn't it? Those are two different things. So I'll illustrate it to you this way. My name is, no surprise, you know it, Bruce Ware. Bruce is verse 1. My parents called me by name Bruce. Ware is verse 7. I was called by their name. Where, right? And my dad reminded me of that <laughs> a few times in my teenage years. Bruce, remember, anywhere you go, you take the where name with you. Okay, I get it, Dad. I get it. You don't want the reputation of the family besmirched. I get it. Um, and, and, you know, so that's one thing for a human name to be passed on, as precious as that is. This is God saying, everyone who is called by my name. Do you realize, children of God out here, that as a child of God, you bear the family name of God? How incredible. Do, do you realize your identity as a son or a daughter of God in his family? That's the name you bear as you go about relating to others, as you speak to people, as you share with them as you conduct your business, as you do everything that you do, you're bearing the name of God as you do that. Should we not care? Much more than, Bruce, remember, you're aware, you can't, you know. Much more than that, should we not remember who we're representing? What name is ours? The very name of God is ours? So indeed, we should live then for his glory, as he says, everyone who is called by my name, whom I have created for my glory. So do you, you get the connection there between being called by his name and being created for his glory. How do we glorify God? By reflecting his character in the way we live our lives, in reflecting to others the traits of God, his holiness, his truthfulness, his kindness, his mercy, his truthfulness. By exhibiting the character of God, we glorify God. We extol the characters that are his, that God in his mercy stamps upon us as he gives us his name. So let me conclude then with two thoughts here at the end. The problem of goodness not the problem of evil, is the real problem that God faces as he sees us in our sins. That is, how can God show goodness, mercy, kindness, and favor towards sinful humanity when all that they deserve is his judgment, wrath, and everlasting condemnation? So we think the problem of evil is such a huge problem. Oh, it is not. Not to God. We think it is. You know, how can a good God and a powerful God create a world in which there is evil? We think that's the big one. And, and so many people have turned away from God based upon the problem of evil. But here's the problem that God faces as he looks at the world. How can I possibly show kindness and goodness to people, all of whom, no exception, all of whom deserve everlasting condemnation? And the only way he can is by offering his son to take our place and bear our sin and our judgment, right? So that we can be forgiven of that sin and be brought into relationship with him in which then he can shower upon us his love. Isn't it amazing? So indeed, the problem of goodness, how can I be good to people who deserve condemnation? That's God's problem that he solves in Christ. Are you a recipient of that kind mercy of God shown to you? Then thank him and praise him. And then last, embrace this special love, this saving covenantal love of God for his own. Be humbled by it. Be filled with joy over it. And be empowered to live lives that express the depth of our dependence upon 
and gratitude for such unspeakably lavish, costly, undeserved love. So, two passages to consider. 1 John 3, verses 1 and 2. See how great a love the Father has bestowed upon us, that we would be called children of God, and such we are. For this reason, the world does not know us because it did not know him. Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not appeared as yet what we shall be. But we know that when he appears, we will be like him. Don't miss the next word. Because we will see him as he is. There will be something about beholding Christ when sin is removed from us, and we will see his glory, and everything within us will be compelled to be like him, the one we see and adore and behold in his glory. We will want to be like him, and we will be made like him forever. What amazing love this is to some. Don't take pride in that. There's no basis for pride in that but fall on your knees in thanksgiving for that. Absolutely. One other verse. In this is love. Not that we love God, but he loved us and gave his son to be the full satisfaction, the full and final payment, the propitiation for our sin. 1 John 4.10 so realize the love of the Father that he has for us, his children, his bride, the bride of the Son, his own, that yes, he does not give to everyone, and he has reasons for not giving it to everyone, but he does give it to those whom he has chosen who come to faith in Christ and enter then into the beginning of what will never end. God's joyous display of his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus forever. What a glorious God. What a great, powerful, awesome, kind, saving, merciful God. May, may we be filled with uh, hearts of adoration and thanksgiving and desires to honor him in the way we live our lives. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for this time together to rehearse some of these marvelous ways in which your love for us has been manifest, though we deserve none of it. So, Lord, we, just like Israel of old, deserve judgment, but you in your mercy through Christ bring to us everlasting salvation. We are so grateful, Lord, and pray that you would fill our hearts with thanksgiving and rejoicing, and a renewed determination by your Spirit, by your grace, to walk in a manner worthy of our calling. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.